Welcome to What a Week, KSQD's Listener's Digest of all the news from this last week that you really need to know. I'm Tony Russomano. And I'm Eric Nelson. And have we got a show for you. Now, you can't be well informed unless you are informed well. And that's where What a Week comes in. For the next hour, we're going to dive deep into what's been going on over the last seven days, giving you a quick rundown of what's happening here in Santa Cruz and in the rest of the world. And because sometimes you just want to get away from it all, we'll play you some music designed to soothe your soul and bring a smile to your face. So turn up that radio, fire up that internet browser, and get ready for another edition of KSQD's What What a a Week. Go get it. Man, that ball's way in left field. I don't care what field is in. Willie plays all field. Every time we come to the game, you're talking about Willie plays all the field. That's right. He plays. Let's call Willie and ask him. Call him. Okay. Hey, Willie. Yes. Are you Willie Mays? Yes. Whose ball was that? Why was it? In left field. Well, that's Evans' ball. I told you that. You... Every time we come to the game, we got to talk about it. The next time, I'm going to sit in the grandstand. Say, I... hey, fellas, what's your name? Say who? Say Willie. Say hey, say who? Swinging at the plate, say hey, say who? Say Willie, that giant kid is great. When he hits the ball, it's long gone man. Hits it farther than camp he can. Swings the bat like a little lead pipe. When they reach the ball, it's over ripe. Say hey, say who? Say Willie, say hey, say who? Swinging at the plate, say hey. Train swings around the second like an aeroplane. His cap flies off when he passes third, and he heads home like an eagle bird. Say hey, say who? Say Willie. Say hey, say who? Swinging at the plate. Say hey, say who? Say Willie. That giant kid is great. Yes, he covers center like he had jet shoes. The other batters get the willy blues Anything hit his way is out Man, it just don't pay those guys to clout Say hey, say who? Say willy, say hey, say who? Swing it at the plate, say hey, say who? Say willy, that giant kid is free Not I could hear him singing. Not much you can uh, add to that. Uh, welcome. This is What a Week with Eric Nelson. And Tony Russomano, and direct from Ebbets Field in Flatbush. Yeah, no, it'd be impossible for any uh, self-respecting Bay Area communications outlet not to uh, mark the great Willie Mays. Uh, and uh, before we plunge into the usual uh, tomfoolery, what are we going to talk about today? Well, this will be a very debatable uh edition of What a Week, as the debates are coming up next week. Uh, the Mango Mussolini is up to his usual uh, usual uh, fun. We've got great local news. What else do we have going on in this particular hour, Tony? Oh, we have lots of uh, cute animal stories. Um, of course we do. Yes, and uh, we have uh, a very ugly uh, story about a uh, organism in space that is, uh, that is wreaking havoc. Oh, Havelock, huh? Not no. just Havoc, huh? Yeah, Rick Havelock. Before we do this, though, uh, The New Yorker, um, Adam Gopnik is a great writer for The New Yorker and has followed in the tradition of The New Yorker's Roger Angel uh, in writing about baseball. And he wrote uh, a tribute to Willie Mays. And uh, I think it's important, to sh- not important, but uh, desirous of us to share it because we really can't articulate uh, the magic of this guy better and uh, Robo Tony I think is on deck here to uh, do a, a reading from the New Yorker so this is a short little bit again this was published in the New Yorker last week in honor of the great great Willie Mays everyone has seen it in slightly decayed black and white footage a center fielder wearing the number 24 turns his back on a well-struck baseball and apparently without looking and using some weirdly powerful instinctive positional guidance, races at top speed toward the stadium wall and then reaches out in front of his body, back still turned, still running hard, and catches the ball. Then in one fluid action, he spins and throws. It is Willie Mays of the New York Giants in Game 1 of the 1954 World Series hauling in a shot by the Cleveland Indians' Vic Wirtz. 
Thousands of plays have happened since, catches as magnificent, and many more meaningful, and yet there it is, the one and only. It is possibly the seemingly both blind and sighted nature of the player as he runs that moves us so. He has an inner confidence about the intersection of his track and the balls, and knows what we don't, that he'll get there. A tenth of a second later and the ball would have dropped for extra bases, but there would be no such tenth. There's an illuminating study of the catch from a scientific perspective that emphasizes May's cognitive capacity for optical acceleration cancellation. That is, the ability to sense exactly when a struck object accelerating will begin to decelerate. It is that dimension of sports, situational intelligence as the jargon goes, or even more sapiently, anticipation, which stirs us. For a very brief moment, the great ones see ahead. It is a fleeting form of prophecy. Oh, the unruffled nonchalance of that game was Philip Ross' concluding remark about New York baseball in the 40s and 50s. If we feel that nonchalance today when we watch Mays, it's because it models the possibility of being at once urgent and at ease, racing as hard as humanly possible to make the play with the secret knowledge that you will indeed make it. That double pursuit, outwardly hard-charging and inwardly serene, is the epitome of grace in every human endeavor. Adam Gopnik, the New Yorker, on the great Willie Mays. Uh, listener, and we have we actually have a few out there, uh, wanted to point out that Willie did not play anywhere near Flatbush. He, in fact, played at the Polo Grounds at Coogan's Bluff. I of see, I was thinking of that. Ebbets Field. Yeah, that was, no, and yeah. accor- according to a baseball savvy, and you do not argue with No, would people. not argue with that source. No, nope. with that source, impeachable source. Uh, but uh, let us move on. So... We were out last week. I was on a brief vacation. I might talk about it a little bit later as I ventured to the deep south. But uh, while yeah, I was gone, I was Tony, what is, what is... What is <laughs> I got go- to sleep in, man, is, I tell you. What oh, is going on locally? Back to our, work, huh? Yeah. Back to the old grind. Here we go. Well, um, Santa Cruz, uh, you'd be uh, distressed to learn. Eric, uh, did, not, did not sleep in your absence. The city of Santa Cruz is hard at work planning many more tall buildings downtown. Uh, could be as tall as 16 stories. Um, in a in a couple of block area along around what is going to be the new uh, clock, you know, yeah the clock tower no not area, the clock tower the this is another one no this is one, da- one. lower yeah lower Wait, well, uh, is there any break news on that we have talked about this is there any new news on this or is it not just, on the clock tower building this is a completely different type of development um, that would be uh, according to the city uh, there would be an eight story limit but that does but then okay you get eight stories and then why am I saying it's going to be up to sixteen stories because of this state law that gives the developer the right to more than double uh, the size of a building if they meet some, you know, some housing goals. So, but, but so is this one? There's the food bin one. There's the clock tower right. one. Is this a different one? This is well, this is a a general plan for the city. Uh, there's no specific development there yet, but the city is is saying in the specific area of downtown um, there will be buildings as tall as so, eight times two, sixteen. So feet, the news on this is again we've talked about this before. So did did some did something pass where now they're saying. Six, the council's now just blanket approving 16 stories. I'm this just trying is to a, get to yeah, the... Yeah, I understand. The, this is a, it's a draft plan. There's a good write-up in Santa Cruz Local. Uh, this is a draft plan the city has released. Now, as with any kind of, you know, city ordinance or, or city rules, you know, there's a public process. You know, there's a lot of talking that goes on. So this is what the city has released for pu- for public discussion. They're, they're quite a ways away from, you know, making it uh, the... The, the general plan or putting it in, in uh, putting it on paper uh, as the local law but uh, what they're hoping is that the developers uh, will come in and build more affordable housing there will be a lot more uh, uh, to say about this there's going to be a uh, a meeting um, let's see uh, a meeting in now they're going on vacation that's right so they're not having a meeting in July so they they dropped this on the on the public a uh, couple of nights ago 
and um, leaving it open for discussion. Uh, now, it's not all big buildings. Of course, there's some other, you know, there's some there's some sugar on the on the on the pill to make it make it go down. Um, there's going to be a public plaza planned for a front and uh, Spruce Streets. Uh, lots of public spaces. Um, a new stadium for the uh, uh, try to keep the Warriors uh, to stay in Santa Cruz, and that's going to be bigger. So the idea is that this area of big development will be around the uh, the new stadium. Well, it's pledged to keep an eye on it if there's some uh, actual meetings or something where people can have some impact on it. You know, my the what a week, or at least my policy, is anything that might obscure the view of the venerable 100-year-old Giant Dipper from anywhere in Santa Cruz should not be built. Just basically, I, you know, that's honestly, it. Draw a line. If, you, if it's blocking the view of the Giant Dipper from anywhere, you can't build okay, it. Okay, here's the bottom line. Uh, there's going to be, the plan could be approved by maybe next spring, but it would take decades to actually implement it. So even though the city council would give the go-ahead, things move very slowly. You can't, you know. Uh, in, in other news, I know we talked about this, was uh, AT&T were thinking, proposing to do away with those pesky copper wire phone lines that is, in some ways, the only way that our uh, folks in the mountains can communicate because uh, there are... Not just the folks in the mountains. Uh, you know, anytime there's a, a disaster in uh, in Santa Cruz, boy, you could rely on, on what's called uh, the, the POTS, the Plain Old Telephone Service, P-O-T-S, uh, to provide you a, a dial tone, which but, cell phones can't do because they don't have backup power in most cases. And AT&T was thinking of eliminating those, but apparently, what, some breaking, actual authentic breaking news? Yes, indeed. California Public Utilities Commission listened to the thousands of people, many of whom... Uh, live in the Santa Cruz Mountains saying, oh, no, you don't. And they you know, said, oh, yeah, you're right. Um, uh, AT&T, sorry, you cannot stop copper phone service. You must continue to provide that basic telephone service to anyone who needs it. Phone company uh, was saying, uh, AT&T was saying, hey, you know, nobody needs copper lines anymore because we've got the internet and uh, all that stuff. And yeah, fine. Tell that to somebody, uh, you know, living up in, uh, you know, Ben Lomond or in, uh, you know, tiny enslaved Felton Grove. You know, they, they, they lose their, their power. They lose their internet service. They lose their phone. Well, that's good news, and uh, another great piece of good news, and only in Santa Cruz today, is Woody's on the Wharf Day. What is Woody's on the Wharf? And I don't think that is a disgraced uh, comedy filmmaker Woody Allen, is it? No, it's not. No, he's nowhere near the Wharf today. Um, But there will be a lot of um, classic and antique cars, Woody's, you know, the uh, the sort of ersatz SUV station wagon thing that that all the the hip surfer dudes used to drive around in uh, with the wood side. There is a big show of those. It's the annual 20, I think 28th, yeah, 28th annual Woody's on the Wharf going on today. Lots of classic cars. This is a big deal for Santa Cruz because it's really the, you know, the big kickoff. One of the one of the many big kickoffs going on this weekend for the summer season. There's this. There's a couple of new rides opening up at the, uh, at the boardwalk. There's the uh, Pleasure Point Street Fair, which... You know, as far as street fares go, that's a that's a pretty good one. You know, if you if you can maneuver uh, around there, be careful of the traffic. It would be, you know, if you got a bicycle, it'd be good to take the bike. But uh, it's a busy busy day today. This is all happening today. And over the hill, uh, this isn't uh, exactly uh, breaking news, but it's interesting news, especially if uh, you're a regular listener of the Grateful Dead Zone, which will be coming up in just forty five minutes. 1012 High Street, yes, accurately named High Street in Palo Alto, is a craftsman home, a two-bedroom home in the Professorville neighborhood that, wait for it, was where the Grateful Dead came up with the name The Grateful Dead when Jerry Garcia, high on DMT uh, at a band meeting, basically suggested it. So what happened was... They were sitting around in November of 1965, and they needed to come up with a name. They were calling themselves the Warlocks, but they discovered there was another band called the Warlocks. And uh, some of the names, Garcia's idea for a name was the Mythical, Ethical, Icicle, Tricycle. There's a catchy one. That's cool. That's nice. The drummer wanted to call it the Vikings or the Crusaders, and Bob Weir wanted to call them his own sweet advocates. So all of those are some of the worst names in the mm-hmm. history. Mm-hmm. So they picked up, remember, uh, this will date, seriously date me. Uh, look it up in your Funkin' Wagnalls, Ronan Martin's Laugh-In. They 
Garcia, remember, high on DMT, picked up a Funkin' Wagnalls dictionary, thumbed through it, randomly stuck his finger down to land on the term Grateful Dead. Oh, and that's random. How, random. Random. Came Trust down, the force, Jerry. And as a biography said, this confused some and appalled others. And what could be better for a rock band? And basically, they did not choose their name. It chose them. Uh, And the headline in the breaking news part of this is, that 100-year-old wood-shingled craftsman is up for sale uh, for the low, low discount price of $2.4 million. So if you want to buy the the actual craftsman house where the Grateful Dead were born, you have your chance. Well, why not? You know, uh, Hewlett Packard, uh, their garage is a uh, is a historical uh, monument well, now, I historical landmark. As far as uh, benign uh, cultural influence, I think uh, the place where the Grateful Dead came up with the Grateful Dead probably wins. I doubt they're going to have uh, anything like that, anything similar uh, to honor Elon Musk. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll get to uh, uh, we'll get to our, our traditional Elon Musk cyber truck bashing in just a minute. But let's have a musical interlude on this edition of What a Week. I'm Eric Nelson. And I'm Tony Russomano. Brand new. We like to play new music that's coming out. Uh, This just came out uh, yesterday. Uh, Petty Country. It's a country music tribute to Tom Petty. And uh, you'll recognize the song at a certain point. But Rhiannon Giddens, great, great artist, decided to cover this particular song in her own unique way. So this is a brand new country tribute to the great Tom Petty.
Views and opinions expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of Natural Bridges Media or KSQD's staff, volunteers, or underwriters. I think that suggests we're about to bash Elon Musk, the richest man on the planet. Would he's, you not he's quite bashable, yeah. And, um, you know, Eric, we saw a, a Cybertruck. Yeah, I saw one in the wild. In the uh, wild, yes. yes. I was driving Eric and his lovely wife, Mrs. Eric, uh, back from the airport uh, a couple of days ago, and... Um, Man, uh, there it was. I saw it creeping up in my rearview mirror. All of its hideousness. Uh, Yes, uh, they are. When you see them, I think there's only 3,000s of these things. But there may be less and less. Uh, The big news is yet another recall. They've temporarily paused Cybertruck deliveries, this time over an issue with one of the most talked about features on the electric truck. It's called the Giga Wiper which is, I guess, a massive windshield wiper thing because they have have this massive slab window, bulletproof, allegedly. And, uh, well, they need to have a windshield wiper on it. It's bulletproof, but it's not uh, baseball-proof, that that great demonstration they had. Over the last few weeks, uh, several users on the Cybertruck Owners Club Forum, there's a news group I really want to join right away, have reported that their wipers have stopped working and... Mm -hmm. uh, Here's uh, one of them. One of them wrote, uh, I was just turned away today at 4 p.m. Eastern time for my Cybertruck delivery. No text or call or any heads up. Wasted trip. And uh, and usual uh, usual bloated corporate fashion. Uh, they're blaming, well, not them. They're blaming the supplier, saying uh, they're pausing all deliveries of Cybertrucks until a new updated wiper motor with a new part number is available to be installed. So the good news is no more Cybertrucks are going to be hitting the road for at least a week. So that that's good and news. And it's a safety issue, of course, with the wiper motor, one of many safety issues, apparently, on the... Uh, on the Cybertruck. Another great cutting technology. We have two astronauts up at the International Space Station who were supposed to have come home a week ago, but the uh, Boeing uh, the Boeing rocket that got them up there that had been delayed and delayed and then delayed and then delayed uh, that finally launched. Now there's some issues with it, and they're nervous about it coming home. So they just told the two astronauts, well, just hang out for a while. We try to fix this thing. What has happened to American manufacturing genius? Well, what's happened to American manufacturing genius since uh, we were able to hit a golf ball on the moon on the Apollo 14 flight. Alan Shepard, in my ever humble opinion, the single defining moment of America is not only we have the technology to get to the moon, we had the wherewithal to smuggle a golf club up and hit a golf ball once there. I mean, that's it. You can pretty much say that ended the American empire, that gesture. But there was a legacy project, and that's V'ger. If you've seen Star Trek, the motion picture, uh, V'ger is going to wind up assuming godlike uh, things and definitely mess up the Enterprise. And Persis Cambada, remember the bald, uh, et cetera. Let's not go too yeah, far no, down. No, no, come on. But anyway, V'ger, though, had well, some problems. Had yeah, some problems. We with reported this on this yeah. that V'ger was uh, finally after uh, how many years since 1970? Oh, close. What? 47 years or 45 something? Years 45 years. 45 years. Since huh? V'ger flew past Jupiter. Oh, yeah. For, right. It's been up for 47 years. 47 years. Yeah. It's, so, anyway, good news, though. It, it stopped working. But, Tony, what's the update? Oh, yeah. Well, how do you fix a computer? Well, you check to make sure it's plugged in, for one thing. And, of course, since it's, uh, what, 15 billion miles away from Earth, that's a heck of an extension cord. So, they, they had to go about. Uh, disassembling the ones and zeros from its programming because they found one of the one of the little one of the little woohoo gadgets um, in antique uh, a, a transistor I guess it was in one of the circuit boards decided to uh, conk out and uh, you know the service call for a 15 billion mile trip uh, that's a heck of a lot of money so they thought they could do a little workaround so they split the uh, computer programming up into two or three different parts and reassembled it uh, remotely on on other other computer parts that are on board the uh, uh, the Voyager. Now, can you imagine? I mean, they're they're figuring out what broke, and then 
being able to take the computer code, put it, break it up into three different parts, and put it on other electronic pieces in that spacecraft, you know, and and have the thing work. So now it's it's talking again, and it's it's going to be relaying information, the scientific information that it has been collecting, very slowly relayed back to uh, back to Earth. And who can forget it? It's one of among many things. It's carrying a copy of Johnny Be Good by Chuck Berry. Chuck Berry. Hey, this is interesting. Uh, NASA had a little online contest, out of you know, random, out of nowhere thing. And uh, it was, um, oh, yeah, they said, uh, this is actually NASA put this up. He said, uh, uh, an astronaut, two astronauts uh, 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 land on Mars, and they're the first astronauts uh, to, to land on, uh, first humans to land on Mars. And they go, and they see a cave, and they go into the cave, and they find the skeletal remains of another U.S. astronaut. And that astronaut, before he died, wrote four words uh, on, on the cave wall. What were those four words? The Send ones, more Chuck, Chuck Berry. Berry. Yes, exactly yes, right. Yes. That's what I wrote. Yes. Uh, yeah, that, <laughs> uh, just because it's an old joke doesn't mean it's not an old joke. So, Tony, ask me about my trip down south that you picked me up at the airport from. Yeah. Where'd so, you go? Uh, well, did uh, the the red state tour uh, it was uh, Savannah, Georgia, Charleston. The, the Ghosts of Slavery Tour was a very interesting trip. I had not been to the South. I'd certainly not driven through the South. And I was anticipating, well, let's just say a slightly different political climate. And I'm happy to say we saw two Trump flags. That's it. And a lot of driving on countryside. But we did see an actual Biden uh, in Georgia. In, in Biden, deep red Georgia. Yeah, Georgia. Yeah. But what was interesting is you didn't see... see uh, uh, any signs of massive support. So if I was the New York Times, I would be doing think pieces now about... Mm. Here's why it's bad If news I was Tom Friedman, you know, who's doing the... I share, the cab driver who brought me to the airport gave me some profundities, and now I'm going to write a column on economic around the world based on the cab driver's insights. Or David Brooks, who loves to go to diners. He was the original diner correspondent, you know? I'm out there with uh, with Americans and in a diner, and I now have a good sense of what they want. I'm not going to go down that, but what I will say was interesting is... Um, it ain't over yet. The the Civil War and the reconciliation with uh, slavery, race. Tony, you mentioned that you'd read the uh, it's uh, who's the writer uh, Eric Larson's book on Fort Sumter on the events that led into Fort Sumter, and we spent a lot of time just looking and can't seeing the ghost of slavery, seeing what monuments are there or not there. So how do they handle the issue of slavery when you go visit these these historical locations? Well, there's locations? plaques now. There's slowly, there's a few plaques around, for instance, Charleston. Savannah, forget it. There's a, uh, a square called Johnson Square, which was the slave epicenter. This is the place where slaves were, were marketed. Nothing there. They have a statue of, I think, uh, uh, some uh, miscellaneous conf- uh, Miss, not a Confederate, but miscellaneous revolutionary war hero. Nothing. Okay, no but look, marking. listen. Uh, when, uh, I, when I when I was in high school, um, uh, my high school history teacher taught us that uh, that the Civil War was not was not the result of a dispute about slavery. It was it was some economic issue. So that was the that was the lie. No, that states' been, rights. States', states rights. rights. It's a lie that's been perfect. That's been just. No, folks, on according, that. it's 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 slavery, slavery. Right, right, so, right. So, so how do they handle that? It, well, it, what I'm saying, it's, you can't make, unlike David Brooks, I can't make a generalization of it. What I'm trying to say is, you know, Savannah, not a lot. Charleston, it's uncomfortable. They've There's an incredible new museum, an African-American museum that just went online a year ago that is on the wharf, Gadsden's Wharf, which was where the slaves came in. It was the in 1808, and it was the last year when slaves were allowed to be imported. There was a law against it. Of course, the law was ignored, but officially slavery and importation ended in 1808. And this is the wharf where last call, a massive amount of slaves came in. And because they didn't know where to put them, over the winter, 700 slaves died on this wharf. So they've built an African-American museum there that's wonderful. And in in Charleston, there's various, you know, if you look hard enough, you can find, you know, again, the ghosts, the holograms of slavery there. There are some plaques up. There's a slave uh, museum and uh, called, that used to be the Ryan Mart that has been around forever that you can find. But it's, you have to chip at it. And we went out to Fort Sumter, 
which is something you have to do. And God bless the National Park Service because the guy who did the presentation to the tourists totally went there. He brought up the fact that, no, this wasn't a war between the states or the War of 1861. This is a war explicitly about slavery. And you could just feel half the audience turning on him. And we went up to him afterwards and asked him about it. And I congratulated him for basically putting it out there. And, and I asked him, you know, do you ever get pushback? And he says, yes. Pretty much every time I do this speech, a section of the audience doesn't want to hear this. And when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, or quote, CRT, critical race theory, this is exactly what they're trying to do again. And, you know, it was, this is my idea of a fun vacation, by the way, is finding artifacts of slavery, but I did. And it was not the stare, you know, it, it, I, I won't say I, can, I came in with an open mind and I left with an open mind. You can't, I'm not going to do that David Brooks, Tom Friedman generalization about the South. They're grappling with it, but it's still in mid-grapple. So this, this National Park Service ranger, unprompted, not, not the result no. of asking a question. He just flat out said— This is his—oh, yeah. yeah, and he made a big point of saying that, which I just felt oh, was great. very laudable. Yeah. But if certain—if uh, the, the ambulatory toxic waste dump and his minions get back in power, and we're going to be getting into that in a moment— you know, I absolutely, all it's going to take is one tourist to write on TripAdvisor or Yelp saying, yeah, this guy was harping on all this. Mm -hmm. And the guy's either going to lose his job or be told to shut up. Mm -hmm. So you can just sense, sense it. But it really did give a sense of, you know, the quote. And when you look at the sil what's going on now, you know, let's, let's actually get into things now. Uh, next week is probably Immunity Day. The debate's Thursday. Wednesday is when the Supreme Court is going to uh, put in the, is Trump and presidents, do they have immunity from all prosecution? They're saving that great decision for last. And if going back to the 1860s, it was the Dred Scott decision of the Supreme Court that pretty much tipped everything over to civil war. And we're in that same position again. The analogies are frightening in so many ways. Now, we're not going to have gray clad, you know, uh, gray clad Confederates versus blue clad armies cavorting around the South. But the fact that these schisms still exist and that we still have a out of touch Supreme Court about to, who knows what they're going to do, but assuming what we know about the Supreme Court, I'm not holding out a lot of hope. And there's a sentencing day coming up also. Yeah, and, and, and you know, the New York Times, there was another thing about, we talk about the South, that because of uh, the cancellation of Roe v. Wade now, this is New York Times statistics, 171,000 people had to travel out of state for abortions last year. And they did a map of where people are going to leave the red states to get what used to be their lawful right to an abortion. And it's eerily, eerily similar to the Great Migration when African Americans after the Civil War in the 20s and 30s to get away from the repression in the red states, which are still the same red states, moved north. It's the same map. Again, history doesn't repeat itself. It rhymes. So, um, well, but there are some bright sides in the South, Tony. There was an ad. Uh, there's some uh, job opportunities down there. I'll let you yeah, read the ad. This sure, is an sure. honest to God ad that appeared. Uh, that appeared. Uh, well, see. Okay. This is the way the ad reads. Ready? Has your child ever wanted to be a Chick Fil A worker? Child, child, get it? Now is the time. We will be hosting a Chick Fil A summer camp. The camper will get the chance to learn how to be a Chick Fil A worker by. Taking orders, delivering orders, making drinks, and being a hostess, which probably come to a, su a surprise to the guys that are there. But your $30 ticket will include a T-shirt, a name tag, and a kid's meal. Space is limited, so buy your ticket to reserve your space today. Ages, kindergarten through sixth grade. So uh, someone, of course, jumped on that and said... I'm so jealous, I didn't think of child labor cosplay first. Uh huh. And then, uh, of course, Waffle House is also a kid fight club. Meanwhile, in the South, Louisiana, uh, they've just, this is going to be heading into the Supreme Court, which is the whole reason they did it. Uh, they passed a law mandating that the Ten Commandments be displayed in every classroom. And the video is shocking because the, the photo op with the, the uh, 
the MAGA governor signing this. Behind him, there's a kid standing there. They had a carefully curated photo op. Behind him, you see, as he's putting pen to paper, the kid faints. The kid drops to the ground, and everyone in the background surrounds the kid and is worried about him. What does the governor do? Keep signing. When they release the official video, they splice that sequence out. But just the 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 optics on that, let's just say, weren't great. Well, Paul Rudnick uh, has weighed in on this thing. Uh, we love Paul Rudnick. He, he goes, Louisiana just passed a law mandating the Ten Commandments, or as the Trump family calls them, ten crackpot ideas that don't apply to us because we have commandment immunity. Mm-hmm. And uh, he also goes on to talk about the Republican Ten Commandments. Such Tony. as, thou shalt cheat on your pregnant wife with a porn star. Thou shalt air doctored footage. Thou shalt ban all women's civil rights. Thou shalt claim to be a Christian while holding the Bible upside down. And thou shalt call any real commandments fake news. Okay, and uh, well, why don't we just take a little break there? Um, I don't, again, don't want to bash the South, so let's get back into uh, petty country. You, you know, when we hold up what we love about the South, and indeed what we love about America, something comes to mind, and that's a Dolly Parton doing a Tom Petty song. So this is the great Dolly Parton on this new record, Petty Country, uh, doing a song aptly called Southern Accents. There's a southern accent where I come from. The youngins call it country. The Yankees call it dumb. Got my. the southern accent where I come from mm-hmm. Now that drunk tank in Atlanta just a motel room to me think I
Sad that Tom Petty couldn't have stuck around to hear that beautiful version. Uh, if they open up Mount Rushmore, might we uh, suggest that uh, Dolly Parton, she gets that fifth slot there. What do you say? Well, we'd like to do something uh, occasionally. Well, Chud. We have a Chud of the Week, which is basically reprehensible uh, characters. Yes, usually Republican. What can I say? And if you're wondering what Chud stands for, Robo Tony can help you figure it out. Chud, cannibalistic, humanoid, underground dwellers. So this just in, uh, some of these stories write themselves. An arch-conservative Republican state representative in Michigan was arrested early yesterday on charges of sexual assault, criminal possession of a firearm, and simple assault. Uh, This uh, police responded to a call of a man with a gun and shots fired in Michigan. I love this guy's name, Cornelius with a K, Wolfram Whisk Sr. Oh, Corny corny Fisk, they call him. according to the police report, he was said to be chasing an adult dancer after a disagreement. He also had a gun in his possession at the time. The adult dancer was said to work for Deja Vu Services, a website that features thousands of beautiful girls and three ugly ones. Thank you so much for that, Michigan. Fisk has been held in jail, was released yesterday afternoon, is going to be arraigned uh, either today or on Monday. And police are, they want to throw the book at this guy. They want to charge him with one count of felony sexual assault, one count of felony assault, uh, excluding sexual, and one count of felony weapons offense. Tony, what did Fisk re-election campaign have to say about well, this? let me just tell you that this is where the re-election campaign earns their big bucks. The campaign issued a statement calling the timing of the arrest highly suspect. As many of us know, Representative Fisk is always exercising his Second Amendment rights. To uh, chase a stripper down the street at no, 3 in the no, morning no. waving no, a all gun. All they focused on was, the, was the, the, the gun charge. Well, that's Second Amendment. Yeah. Ignore all the other stuff, please. So, yeah, let, let's face it. A 62-year-old Republican lawmaker carrying a gun is found in the street chasing an adult dancer. But don't worry, he's against porn and abortion and affirmative action and all that good stuff. So his re-election to the Michigan State House is doubtlessly assured. After all, in the Republican Party, it is the year of the felon getting charged with waving a gun around while chasing a dream girl down your own block at 3 a.m. is probably a badge of honor. And how bar, how low can that bar go? Panhandle Putin. Remember uh, DeSantis? Yes, Ron DeSantis. Overwhelmingly, GOP state legislature passed their budget for the new fiscal year of the $117 billion. 32 million or 0.027 was to help pay for museums and arts organizations and DeSantis just zeroed that out. Thank you so much. Uh-huh. So they say uh, DeSantis does not enjoy anything and his base is also people who cannot enjoy anything. So zeroing out culture makes sense. But I feel like this. This also reflects the post-Trump aspirants spinning the seething idiocy dial and looking back at the audience. Again, it's all performative. It's like the Ten Commandments thing. They're trying to send a message here, folks, uh, and it's a pretty scary message, and it's showdown. We're going to have a lot to talk about uh, next Saturday. One thing I can promise you, Tony, I will not be watching the debates Thursday. I'm not doing it. I don't care. I know. I'm just saying is I can't. I can't. The, the stress is too much. I like I, What I do is uh, monitor obsessively social media and see how it's going and what the response is. But uh, New York Times does not fill me with reassurance. Uh, this morning uh, they did an article on Biden's closest three advisors, Um, and these guys, well, uh, Ron Klain is the youngest. He's 62. There's a guy named Mike Donilon, who's 65, and Ted Kaufman uh, is uh, his perhaps closest advisor is 85, four years older than Biden. Mm. And I'm not going to go into the, oh, well, they're too old to give good advice, though one could draw that thing. 
Let's talk about the resume. What, are you going to trust like a 23-year-old to give good advice? Well, Klain is the head guy. He used to be the chief of staff, and he's Biden's right hand. But the New York Times, they, here's his resume. Now, uh-huh. see if you can okay. spot what... what, uh, what All right, let, let, me, let me read it, okay? It says, uh, Mr. Klain was briefly chief of staff for Vice President Al Gore and oversaw the recount Fa- effort in Florida in failed, 2000. Failed recount effort. He was involved in John Kerry's 2004 campaign failed. and spent some years as an advisor to Steve Case, a founder of AOL. Major fail. Mr. Biden's trust was tested in 2015 when Mr. Klain went to work for Hillary Clinton as she pursued the presidency signing on before Mr. Biden had formally decided against a run of his own. And we all know how well the Hillary Clinton run for presidency went. Failed. Fail, fail, fail. So the debate, you know, there's a lot of think pieces by New York Times uh, pundits and Washington Post pundits talking about how Biden really has to tuck it to Trump and defend himself, et cetera, et cetera, and bring up the felon thing and really go aggressively which i think actually is a this is one of the realm of opinion i already played the disclaimer here i don't think that's the way to go i you know uh i'm not i don't have ron Klain's uh portfolio of great advice i'm not responsible for the recount the gore the gore Kerry and hillary clinton uh campaigns all of which were dismal failures but it strikes me that biden Here's what I would do if I was giving a Biden. Uh, I don't know if we could use this slogan on the radio. My unofficial slogan, and Biden should be hammering it, is at the age of 81, Biden has no F words left to give. Well, that's true, because He's it doesn't been, matter who's elected. They'll both, you know, either one will be a lame duck, and they, they have no Fs but to the give. Di- but the point is that Biden's been a, a, a professional politician for over 50 years. This is his last at bat. He doesn't care anymore. He doesn't have to run for anything. What he should be doing is what Obama should have done in his second term, which is to say, Let's go for it. Let's do everything I always wanted to do. What's there to lose? Well, there is another way to look at it also, and that is uh, a a lame duck uh, either can do what you're saying, no Fs left to give, or uh, the lame duck could be looking out for the next generation, for the the vice president who presumably will try to run. It's all the same thing. in, In this case, both Biden and Trump have no Fs left to give, and they want to cement, each one wants to but cement his own legacy. But the difference is, Biden, rather than keep dwelling on, well, I passed this act three years ago, and look how this is, and I know you think the economy's bad, but here's some statistics that belie that. Nobody wants to hear this. What I think Biden should be saying is, this is what I'm going to do. And Trump now is is promising to bring up migrant crime. That's his big bugaboo. Migrants, migrants, ooh, scary, scary, ooh, ooh, spooky. How about Biden hammer on the climate like next week with a heat wave that everyone in America is scared to death of. Everyone in the red states are looking over their shoulders at either flooding, tornadoes, hurricanes, serious stuff happening that even the most pinheaded Fox viewer has something to do with climate change. Why isn't Biden saying this is the issue we need to grapple with right now? This is what Trump is going to do. By the way, Trump, who said openly he wants a billion dollar campaign contribution from the oil companies to put him in the uh, White House again so he can basically eliminate everything remotely climate friendly. That's his goal. So in essence, you know, it, the choice is Biden should be saying this is one of the things I'm going to do. It's not what I've done. It's what I will be doing which you don't get a lot of. What is the second term? Well, I won't be Trump. I won't do this. I won't do that. I don't really want to hear that anymore. We get that. What are you going to do? And that's the frustration of this. And, you know, to me, the the thing should be talk about the big win. Forget talking. He's going to win. I think Biden will win. But we want Biden not just to win. We want him to crush it. We want a crushing victory. Well, that would be nice, yeah. But even if but even if he doesn't class. get a crushing victory, Biden has the has the benefit of being really astute as a politician and knows how to trade. So you know he will get things done. He'll get things done by by spending his, as they say, political capital because he, he doesn't that, need it any longer. But no, but is he saying that, Tony? Well, well, yeah, of course he he has said it by by no, his actions. No, but yeah, okay. yes, yes, by, right. by yes, Fine. by the bills that have passed already. Uh, yes. Okay, and I think that's absolutely wrong, and that's why he's going to lose the oh, debate in the election out. because nobody cares. Nobody, the people who are going to vote for Biden aren't you, the local head of the you know Democrat 
guys or us Democrats in the blue states. The people who are going to vote for Biden that are going to tip the election in the swing states aren't us. They're people who are feeling malaise in the words of Jimmy Carter. They want to know what they're voting for, not what they're voting against. And Biden's campaign now is so wrapped up in what they're voting against that isn't, uh, you know, that speaks for itself. Sure, 34 felon thing, fine. That's all great. It doesn't matter to these voters. They want to know what he's going to do. And if you think that Biden has successfully articulated a can-do, looking forward, this is what my second term is going to be, I'm not reading that. I'm not seeing it. I've been known to read a few newspapers, Tony. The solid blue people and the solid red people are not going to change. But, but, the, it's but the, the people in the middle who are and thinking, what who, who are looking at the ballot and thinking, do I really want to elect a felon as president? That's where it'll make a difference. Not, they won't. The felon thing is going to have zero impact on All this. Right, it's going to be what Biden is going to do. Are you saying that Biden shouldn't articulate a no, second term? No, of course term? not. I'm, you're, you're just saying it makes no difference. I'm saying, yes, it makes a difference I to, think a, the to a certain percentage of the, of the voting populace. But when you look at his, so far, everything the Three Stooges, his three geriatric advisors are telling them, none of them are about what I will do in my second term. None of them are about, you know, let, if you want a fear issue, let's use the climate which everyone is fearful on articulate that in language Americans can understand. Well, Your trailer is going right. to be wiped away. Yeah. Simple things that he can do that sure. he is not doing. And thinking that felon, 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 he has hair bad, you know, he's losing cognitive things. He's even older than I am because he's stumbling in his speeches, says Biden to Trump. That isn't exactly what you're voting for. You're voting for what are you going to do for me? And that's what's not happening. Well, we'll see what he says during the debate. Yeah, we know what he's going to say. And I don't think it's going to be articulating a vast using bringing up climate in the same urgency that Biden or that Trump is bringing up migrants. It'll be mentioned as, well, four years ago, we instituted this policy and we got in the Paris Accords. And gee whiz, I wonder if it isn't I'm going to do this, a sweeping program to address the issue that will uh, directly affect people in the swing states. Now, I'll tell you something that will affect them and something that I am worried about uh, uh, with Biden is that he is f- focusing on on inflation. Inflation is dropping down to zero. Inflation is at zero. OK, but prices are still high. You know, we need deflation, you know, so people are still paying 20, 25 percent more than they were four years ago. It doesn't matter when he says inflation is at zero. People are wondering, well, how co- if inflation zero, how come prices are still high? Because they're not increasing anymore, but they say? have already increased over the past four and years. That's he, that's what he needs to address. That's what I'm saying. But that's, again, vague, amorphous a policy things. If he wants to address inflation, he can talk about... No, no, I no. Stopped, Eric, you, you didn't, can you I didn't hear me. Can I finish my thought? We you, could you, stop didn't, the, you didn't hear me. I did hear you. I'm saying he should say something, what he'll do. He stopped the merger of Albertsons and some of the grocery chains that are jacking prices up, going after CEOs who are paying themselves massive, obscene amounts of money and passing the salaries down to the consumers, which is jumping the price. These are practical things he can be saying, not amorphous, well, inflation's better than I... It's Look, it's coming down according to this bar graph. That isn't what people want to see. I was, they want to hear was... something... <laughs> They want to hear something, Tom. I, I was agreeing with you, Eric. I was telling you is one thing that I but, that I that, please, but it's specifics, Tom. Oh, come on, it's specific. If, if I could just finish a sentence, perhaps you will understand what I'm trying to say. I was agreeing with you in that yes, there, he does have deficiencies, and one of them is that he is he had been focusing on inflation, and he needs to get off that and talk about, as you say, what he would do to bring prices down because people will look at the inflation number and and question why is it that I'm still paying more. I was agreeing agreeing with you. All right. But the point is, though, what I'm saying is that not, it's, it's not a time for vague generalities and things to do. It's about specific stuff. I mean, even a slogan, just, you know, MAGA, make America great again. How about America is better than this? America is better than this. Just something that you can stick to, you know, a slogan that works, that you repeat, that enters the lizard brain of swing state voters. Yeah, the the chuds out there, forget it. They're going to vote for Trump no matter what. And after he shoots somebody in Fifth Avenue, they'll even vote more for him. But what I find and what, what alarms me greatly is the lack of articulation and fighting spirit in Biden and 
that, that's his brain trust of geriatrics, as the New York Times pointed out, failed geriatrics, is giving him the wrong advice. And I would be so happy if I'm wrong next Saturday, Tony. I'm looking forward. I would love bring in a giant bit of crow if Biden hits any of these points and doesn't spend the entire debate wallowing in vague policy things and references to the Infrastructure Act, et cetera, which you can just see people's brains turning off all over the country. He's got to get into it. But we digress. This is not but as it, but it was this fun. Is nearly it was fun. as important as well. Here's the lead, folks. Sex crazed zombie mm. cicadas. Oh. Tony, what what's going on with sex crazed? The, the real thing I think the only thing we have to fear is fear itself and sex crazed zombie cicadas. What's up with that? There is a fungus that is infecting. You cicadas. had me on fungus. Okay. All right. So there's a there's a fungus. It is it is being seen uh, across the eastern states, the southern states. Fortunately, you know we're not big on cicadas out here. We don't have to worry about those those noisy, awful things that show and I up. I heard every a bunch of them in the years. south. By the way, they're definitely out there. That's right. Um, so they are they take over the the cicadas. Um, so they, the mind bending fungus is turning cicadas into sex crazed zombies. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah, although it, it, uh, sex crazed zombies. But you know, once you hear what the what the fungus does to the to the cicadas, you have to wonder what about it? How can they be sex crazed? Is this crazed? all of them or just a few of them? Uh, the choice ones. Uh, the the, um, uh, the the bugs they 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 mate with the uh, with the male and the female cicadas, and uh, there's a there's a hormone that gets a you flicked into into life and uh, it's, all things happen but but the, the the thing that happens that affects their um their their sex craziness is that the fungus causes the cicadas um, private parts to fall off um i don't know how else i can explain that uh, the front and the back it uh, also produces an amphetamine too that quote gives them the focus of someone on adderall speaking of donald trump they're just loaded with amphetamine so that's where the crazed part comes that crazed yeah so right. they're 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 their the fungus is distending their abdomens, their right. genitals and rear ends fall uh-huh. off, and replaced the, by and the mind altering chemicals right, in the fungus. Right. And, and keep the male, them looking for a mate despite uh, not being able. They're in cells. They keep looking right. for a mate despite not being and able. And further to, confusing uh, the the alternate uh, the the opposite sex of cicadas. The male cicadas uh, start making noises like the females. They they flick their wings. They sound like females, and that's a mating invitation. So we get the males, you know, uh, kind of you know cross dressing, and uh, you know on and on it goes. And we're not making this up, folks. These infected bugs are sometimes called, and I quote, the flying Flying salt shakers of death. Because as they beat their wings together, they deposit salt-like spores onto the ground that can infect future generations that emerge from the soil. But this is my favorite part. This is the kicker of this article, and this was in the Washington Post. Honest to God, we're not making this stuff up. Even if a person were to consume an infected cicada, the exposure to chemicals that drive cicadas wild would probably be too small a dose to have an effect. Probably too small. So this is implying that people are eating infected cicadas to get high, I think. I'm not quite sure about that, but this is where they're going. And the doctor said someone would have to eat dozens or hundreds of infected cicadas to be affected by the stimulant And in stating the obvious department, he notes, that's a bad idea in part because scientists have no idea what the other chemicals present will do to people. This is happening in deep red United States. So, uh, you know, all you folks that are tired of California and want to move uh, to the east or the south, (laughs) knock yourselves out. But uh, go easy on the on the fungus uh, cicadas. Well, it's time for our boot heels to be wandering. Another thrill packed. Uh, we'll be certainly back to unpack the debate, which I repeat, I will not be watching. Eric and I are going to duke it out in the in the parking lot in the well, next we'll hour. See. No, yeah, Tony, we'll I hope tickets. I hope you're right. I hope uh, I hope he uh, hits all those those bases and uh, listens to me for once. But I uh, I have my <laughs> fears. Uh, in just a few seconds, it's going to be time for the Grateful Dead Zone. You are listening to KSQD Santa Cruz KSQT Prunedale. What a week! We'll be back next week. Uh, so let's all strap in and let's wait for the Supreme Court Wednesday and the debate on Thursday, shall we?